This is the third week of the message series, the um, preparing for mission. Over the first two weeks of this series, we've been looking at some of the ways in which the disciples have been called to prepare the way of the Lord as he moves towards Jerusalem. We've had various challenges thrown out to them to what it means to follow Jesus. The call to leave family and friends, the challenge to live without security, without having all those resources we need to, to survive during life. And then the, finally the challenge of how to go into hostile towns and villages that didn't want anything to do with you because you're going towards Jerusalem. But if we listen to those gospel passages over these last two weeks, it almost seems that even though life is difficult and challenging, there is also something to be rejoicing we heard that at the end of last Sunday's Gospel, where when the disciples came back, or the 72 came back, they came back rejoicing. Lord, they said, even the devils submit to us when we use your name. Rejoicing is a wonderful thing, and sometimes when I go into classrooms, I rejoice. As I said, sometimes. Little children have a way of asking questions that can be very challenging, like, who made God and who's God's mother? Some of those that questions you really can't answer, so you smile at them and you try and get out of it. But it's interesting, when you, I try to answer those questions, I sometimes have this feeling that I wish I had the ability to find child-friendly language to answer them. I was amazed at teachers as they can find ways of being able to share a story with children in language that they can really understand. Sometimes I think parents have that ability as well, and I think it would be good to be a teacher or a parent, but I only think that for a couple of seconds. It's good enough being an uncle, I can give them back. But there's a thought that stops us for a moment. What is it that God is trying to say to us? Because we need to listen to the stories. And in today's gospel, we have an incredibly challenging parable. A parable that tells us something quite profound. It's almost as if Jesus, in this story, is taking a blowtorch to everything that the Jews held to be sacred. The lawyer comes along and we're told to disconcert Jesus. So he's there for a purpose. He says, which is the greatest of the commandments? What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus immediately throws the question back to him. Well, what do you read in the scriptures? Now, he gives the answer, which is the Shema, the prayer, uh, which every Jew would pray of a morning and an evening. Lord, um, you must love the Lord your God with all your soul, with all your might, with all your heart and all your strength. Now, that comes from the book of Deuteronomy. But then the next section, the passage which is taken from Leviticus, and love your neighbour as yourself, was the great commandment that Jesus gave in the other Gospels. Here, it is the lawyer who says it. So Jesus says to him, well done, what you have said is right. But then the man has that question which says, but who is my neighbour? The story that Jesus then tells as I said, puts a blowtorch to everything that the Jews held to be sacred. Every Jew know, knew the demands of ritual purity. To touch somebody who was dead, or even brush against them, or brush against something that had touched a dead person, meant that, that the person who was touching them, or being touched, was ritually unclean. Now, for a priest or a Levite, that had a double jeopardy because if they then went anywhere near the synagogue or the temple, they would make the synagogue and the temple unclean and they would be excommunicated. They would be cut off from everything to do with their Jewish life until such time as they were able to be purified. But the process of purification of the temple or the synagogue was an incredibly complex thing and demanded a whole lot of behaviour that was way beyond normal behaviour. So there's a question here, how do they cope with what's going on? So their initial response is not to get involved, 
because their whole life would be impacted by it. The Samaritan, when he comes along, doesn't consider any of those things. He sees the man who is in need. And so he reaches out to him and he helps him. And we told us that when he took hold of him, he bandaged his wounds, washed them, took him to the inn and then cared for him. And then says to the innkeeper, look, if anything extra is needed, I will pay it on my way back. He obviously must have been a traveller who had passed that way on other occasions because it's highly likely, unlikely that the uh, innkeeper would have accepted the word of a Samaritan and that he would come back to pay him. But he does. So this man is obviously something quite wonderful. The mission that Jesus is inviting us is to say, do we look at things around us and make judgments about how it fits into our timetable into our lifestyle, or are we like the Samaritan and who says, this is what's necessary, this what needs to be done? We need to perhaps have a wonder about what God is asking of us. And I think we get a bit of a hint from that first reading from the book of Deuteronomy. Moses, in that passage, is aware that the law, even though it's written down and even though the law is important, it needs to be something of a heart experience and not just an external expression. Moses says to the people, Obey the voice of the Lord your God, keeping his com these commandments and the laws of his, so that you shall return to the Lord your God with your heart and your soul. So it's not just an external expression. It has to touch their heart, has to touch their soul. If we look at the priest and the Levite, they were still in the expression of this is the law. This is what we've got to do. Now, I don't want to put words into the mouth of Moses or thoughts into his mouth. But if you have a listen to the end of the passage, he says this. He says, the word is very near to you. It is in your mouth and in your heart for your observance. So Moses knew that the letter of the law was important, but that whole notion of total acceptance was important. And it gives an image of God that speaks about compassion for people, compassion for us and our needs. If we want to get another image of what God is, then that passage from the letter to the Colossians, our second reading, gives us a very beautiful expression of it. Now, the whole of the, the hymn is a wonderful uh, gift of uh, Paul to us. But I'd just like to take the first few lines where Paul says, Jesus Christ is the image of the unseen God and the firstborn of all creation. For in him were created all things in heaven and on earth. Now, as we read the Gospels, we know that Jesus lived out this kind of experience and that's what he taught the people. And he began when, in the beginning of Luke's Gospel where he goes into the, the synagogue in Nazareth takes the scroll of the prophet Isaiah and proclaims, the spirit of the Lord has been given to me and he has anointed me. He's told us that God is in his heart and given him life. Later in John's gospel, he says, the father himself loves you for loving me and believing that I came from God. So he's telling us that once we begin to have a relationship with him, then something changes in our world because we love not we obey, not we do what the commandments, but that we love him and that we live in him. So through this week, these few weeks of this mission, as, we, as this prepa series preparing for mission, as we listen to Jesus as he moves towards Jerusalem, he's giving to the people, giving to us, a new understanding of what it means to have relationship with the Father. It was a concept that was unknown to the people at the time and was one of the reasons why they were so set on stopping him because he talked about God as Abba, Father. He was saying to them that this is so much more than just a God out there. So today I'd like to invite you to take another step on this journey and to listen to the passage of, from 
Luke's gospel, the story of the Good Samaritan, and no longer look at the Good Samaritan as somebody who just wandered along, but to create or understand that this might be a portrait of God, a self-portrait of the God who loves us. So what would it mean if we now envisage God as the Good Samaritan? The helper's move now towards the victim is reminding us of what God does for us in Jesus Christ, of sending his son to save us and to promise us, as the Samaritan promised the innkeeper, if there is anything else that needs to be done, I will do it when I return. God wants us to be saved. God wants us to be healed. God wants us to be in relationship with him not because we obey the laws, but because we know what love means. Becoming aware of what our vocation of being a missionary disciple grows because of this. And it becomes something of what uh, the challenge that Jesus presented to the lawyer at the end of the gospel. Go and do the same yourself. To care about others and to be concerned for what goes on in our world. The response can be lived out in our lives when we actually respond to others as generously and graciously as God has responded to us.